think we came up with it. We're going to do a sign. Uh, we had to turn the machine down because it was too much background noise, or otherwise you could see a bunch of sparks. Uh, Josh, get a picture of this, but uh, we should be right about at 11.05. So we are live at 11.05. This is BC. We're with Spirit Cars. That's our little tech show in the middle of the day. Uh, Josh, the voice of Spirit Cars, is behind the camera here. And we have been talking all week about doing a contest, and we were going to give away something for whoever gets their name pulled out of a hat. The way to get your name in the hat is to share any video that we up posted on our uh, website, this on our Facebook website this week. And see, we're going to use his hat we're going to on use his it. hat. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we're going to grab all of them, and at noon today, we're going to put them names in, pull it out of the hat. Uh, this is a sign we made for, oh... Cotter, I think, may be using these to put on their light poles or something. But if you can get a picture of this as you go by, this is going to be a... Which one is this? Is this a Hot Rod Highway? Hot Rod Highway. So you can maybe get an idea, but it will be a, a pretty neat sign. It's, it's kind of on a Route 66 background, isn't it? Yes. With, and it says Hot Rod Highway on top of it, and it looks like a pretty cool Model A on it. So I think what we're going to talk about is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So let's go over to this 27th. We got a big shop, it's 24,000 square feet, but we don't have internet service everywhere, so it's always been a big no-no doing body work in the clean area, but at least we get Wi-Fi service so I can show you what's going on here. I got thinking this morning, we've been working on this 27, it's for Larry, about the good old days and about uh, the quality and about how things last. I was looking at the Olympics. They showed some Olympic stars from 50 years ago in gymnastics. They were doing a somersault. That was pretty good. Now they're just going crazy and wild and jumping everywhere. Evil Knievel is a big deal if he jumped over a few, few uh, buses or something. Now it's just back and forth, over and over. It shows and everywhere they, what they do. The cars are kind of the same way. I'm a, a huge fan of, of, of George Barris, who's not with us anymore, and... and uh, Big Daddy Ed Ross, who's not with us anymore. Daryl Starbird is still building cars. And I'm not taking anything away from those guys. They were awesome in their day. They were creative. And they took it to where we are now. But if you look at some of the old cars back in the day, they weren't quite as nice as what uh, we expect now. Um, the guys like Chip Poos have taken it to a new level. Uh, I remember back when, when Lexus ran the first commercial about a, a ball bearing running down the body seams. I started doing body work in 75, and part of doing body work, you had a bunch of shims. Cars were put together with shims. Now the tolerances are much, much closer than that. So a couple tips for today. This is the 27 we've been working on. I think we're going to follow through. Customer Larry wanted a body line up here. The door gap didn't match very well, so we cleaned up the door gap, and the, and the lines were not right, and, and he had a good suggestion. Well, why don't you put a body line there? So we've added a body line. He wanted a body line coming out here. Here's a tip. These body lines don't match here, but I gotta make it match. If I go on the line here, that's gonna be about right, and swing it around to make sure I don't have a dip go into it, I'll know where to cut here and where to add down here. Now you got to be careful about shrinkage. I learned the hard way, and, and we're going to learn. I got a, a friend here, an old uh, old chassis builder, who's been doing it a long time. And I learned a long time ago. It's easier to learn from somebody that's been there, done that, than it is to find out the hard way. But I've learned an awful lot the hard way too. I got a garage find. It was a pretty cool. I didn't even know what it was, but it was a Kellison. And uh, pulled this thing out, and why? And it was cool. It needed a lot of work. We worked on it, and I did it over a winter. And I had this thing slick, man, I blocked on it, and it was 60s technology, it was a fiberglass car, and uh, the materials weren't quite as good as they are now. I had that thing, I mean slick. I took it out, summertime, first 90, 100 degree day out there, everything starts shrinking, and man, 
was that disappointing? I, I had hours and hours and hours in doing that. And um, different materials do a little different. A lot of times, and this is a kind of a rule of thumb, but not an absolute, like, like our 70 degree rule yesterday, you've got about a 30 day 90% cure rate. And it takes a whole lot longer to get that last little bit of cure. And it needs a little bit of heat. A lot of our activated uh, materials, I had it described to me like this once, the old lacquer products, it was like driving on a dirt road. The dirt road could get hard, but whenever it rained, it got muddy again. You can take an old lacquer job and take some thinner, wipe it, and you will soften that lacquer and pull lacquer back off of it. Where the new uh, urethanes and polyurethanes and activated materials, it's like concrete. Once it's activated, it, it chemically links, and uh, a solid won't penetrate or anything like that. But it does have a tendency to shrink. So be aware of that. The new, it's the new standard. What I could have got away with 30 years ago to be the most awesome hot rod is not an awesome hot rod anymore. We like tight gaps. We like seams that work. We like, and th this is an area that it's important. If, if your seams are not good and tight and clean looking, uh, that that's going to cost you points if you do want to show your car and it. And it's just not the new standard. Here's a tip you might want to might want to use, especially in a fiberglass car. In a metal car, um, it's a little different. You can weld a piece in, or you can do. I was going to actually get my wax and my paddle out and ask if anybody knew what that was, let alone how to do it. I'll give you a letting tip, though. I learned this one. I hate saying it at a bar from alignment because I could not get the. If you got a stick of lead, you have your wax paddle, or your, your wood paddle, it's in a tube of wax. You got your lead, it's in, a, it's in a stick like this. You got your car ground, you got to tin it. Tinning is easy, you use an acid, put it on there, you wipe it around, you get it hot, you get it hot, and then you just push it in and, and get it, it's a wire brush, get it all, everything, lead on everything. Now you got to get your lead from here to here. It's all about even heat. This guy, I kept having it fall over. Watch it start drooping. Hit the heat over here. Keep your wax wet. Keep doing the circle. And then when it just gets dripping, then you can just put it on there. Sticks, take your wax paddle, put it on. We're not letting. I haven't let it in years. I do have my stuff. This is strand for the chopper gun. It's roving. We have a mat and everything else, but this is all just one big string. If my door gap is a little bit short and I want to lengthen it, I took and put a piece of paper or tape back here. What I'll do is I'll grind a, a V on this, or a, a bevel, not a V. Leave it down flat. And I can glass this in. When I say glass it in, I mean put some resin on it, let it kick, and then I'll put some mat on the back side of it, and that will be just as strong as the original fiberglass. Um, or if it's metal, you can just add and weld to it. The different products, now again, you have dry times, you have shrinking, you have... When you put the primer on, you don't want to put it on 40 grit scratches, you want to take it to 220. That's less chance. Every material has got a little bit different expansion and contraction rate based on the heat. If it warms up, this primer may not expand as fast as the fiberglass on it, under it. Or when it cools down, it will shrink at different rates. You gotta be careful that you're not cracking in areas. And you gotta be careful that your paint doesn't shrink up. You know, give it that proper flash, uh, flash time and uh, proper heat. And I've seen cars that we've done, I mean, 20 years later, 30 years later, they should look as good as when you finish, and a lot of times they'll look better because someone has spent a lot of time waxing and cleaning and doing. So, a couple tips today. Yesterday wasn't today. Today's not tomorrow, but whatever we build, let's build with the best quality we can today. Just take it into the future. Now we're going to go back to the past and wind up in the future here. A friend of mine, George, is here. I still remember last time you we were here. This is George. George. 
Okay. All right, very good. And we, we need to speak up. Our technology is not great here. We've, we got some pretty good stuff. I would have never thought. I told you could, him, just give me the thumbs up if I'm not loud enough. You're not loud enough. They, see, the thing is, we're live, <laughs> and people can send questions in. Oh. And there's comments, so they can, right now, if we're not loud enough, they can tell Josh. And, uh, tell the old guy to speak up. Tell the old guy to speak, to, old guys to speak up. <laughs> I we, can say that. Yeah. Well, we I got hearing problems. I don't know. You got hearing problems? So, I got them in, okay, they, so they, if you don't hear me, let me know. Hear <laughs> well, enough about our old age and problems. How'd you get in this business? Well, I got out of the uh, military in '70, and I bumped around a year or two, and I was inspired to go to welding school because I wanted to start building some motorcycle parts. And uh, went down to Texas with some friends of mine and ended up building top fuel cars. We built top fuel cars for quite a few years. In about '80 80 or '81. Uh, at that period of time, the cars accelerated so hard they were towing in the rear end. Everybody go to the wrecking yard, get a nine inch out, and pick mm -hmm. it up. And they were they were they were living after that. And so we designed a, the first the sheet metal fabricated type housing you see in all the race cars. Pretty much. I know last last time you were here, we talked a lot about rear end housing, and you did that for quite a long time, didn't you? Uh, Seventeen years, I I built until I became a rear end. I told my wife that's because I was seven days a week. We did them for top fuel cars, then we made them the pro stock cars, and really abusing type deals, uh, the funny cars. Got into the bracket cars, uh, you know, built them for uh, Chris Austin out there at Chassis Works, and then uh, he was still building race cars at that time. Did you, your company have a cars. name, or did you build them for other companies? I built them under Pro Designs. Pro Designs. Yep, and I still have the company name, uh, and we built cars. How many rear ends you got out there, you think? You know, I, I've, had, I've got a log book, and I don't know, but I brought you some pictures of the disc, and the serial number on that one was a funny card, about 739 or something. I, I serial numbered all of them, all the racing stuff, the street stuff I did, and we, and we did some all road stuff a little bit, but uh, it's probably over a thousand. So there's some pretty cool, and it, would you call it old school now? A lot of people have copied the design. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I made a comment to a magazine writer friend of mine who was in the industry for forever, and, and that's now a dead issue for writer printed magazine. Mm -hmm. I, go away. I sent him a deal, a picture. I saw Strange Engineering. was one of my, I bought a lot of stuff from those guys, and, uh, and we were in competition for a They had a kind of aluminum cast deal in later years, and uh, everybody said, oh, you'll never sell this thing. And it became the standard for the sheet metal stuff, and now... Mark Williams came out with a modular type boat in I just saw the other day. It's been out a year, and I just don't keep up with it. But, but Strange Engineering... We're, we're getting the sign okay, from... I, Strange Engineering is now building one, and I just sent this link to my buddy up there, and he said, I said, I'm the only guy that's not building my own room anymore. Oh. <laughs> so many people doing it. So I guess it's either... Uh, I would say it's a, it's a compliment to me. It's really because they're cheap and more good themselves. <laughs> I think that's the deal. We... Uh, <laughs> I can still do it. I just don't do it for production basis anymore. What it comes down to, I think we've all been building on somebody else's ideas and building on some. I mean, starting with some of the early builders. Well, they say there's no new invention, just reinvention. Reinvention. That's probably not a bad way to look at it. We were, we were talking about brakes the other day and doing a little thing on brakes. I saw and, that. And uh, I looked it up. The first uh, brakes, hydraulic brakes, were done by Duesenberg in a 1914 race car, and I think he put them on production cars in the 20s. And the comment was, if he had enough sense to patent the idea, he'd have been a wealthy guy. <laughs> so, yeah. but it patents are how much you're worth, how much you're willing to spend to defend it. And the small companies, you know, the guys build them too, and you go after him. What are you supposed to build? So, you, and so you're lawyered out financially. <laughs> so you do what you do. Well, our last meeting, I enjoyed it. We spent. We spent a lot of time, and, and you got real technical on rear ends, which we don't have time to do no. now. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at myself here. If you want to be a hot rod builder, everybody tells me, oh, you got the job everybody wants. You yeah. don't like to get dirty. This, this is, is not, not it. <laughs> be a welder, too. You don't like to yeah. get dirty. This is not the job for you. But if you like to create things, and you, you've been in the oil industry, and building things is what you do. Pretty okay, right. so we got a 9-inch rear end. What does somebody need to know about a rear suspension? If you can do that in just a couple minutes. Uh, I like, in a street car, uh, uh, I like something that articulates well. Mm -hmm. It doesn't bind in any direction, any axis. You know, it's got, it, 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 
goals left or right. Let, let me context this now okay. first. We build hot rods here. Some of the projects you just got off of doing a scarab, old road racing stuff, uh, uh, a reproduction of uh, Aston Martin. an Aston Martin. I did the Grand Sport Corvette, the first six or seven of those, was the guys out of Dallas. So we're, we're talking high tech, in, in a sense, racing technology. It's same old school, but it, it's, yeah. it's, it's way different right. than me putting a straight axle on and, and a couple of radius rods. So anyway, go ahead. And give us give us some information. Well, you know, the basic thing is the guys get these things uh, and they'll buy housing and they'll come out here and put well and I see this in various form and they'll weld a bracket, well it's down and they grind it out real well to two or three times to make it look nice and grind it. So, you know, they, it, that 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 toes them in or, or whichever way it is it's shrinking, it moves the, the bearing in and and uh, so in my world uh, alignment is critical, and the nearer the housing is, more critical. You're not that, working out on a bigger arm. That's a major issue. So if you don't understand what you just talked about, if, if I put a bracket here and I weld it hard on this side, it's going to want to pull. Right. It does. Pull the axle, and it will put your everything out of the line. So you want to. Right. So what just give us a good technique of how to how to weld a bracket. Well. You know, one of the deals, uh, Pete and Jake, I noticed their deal, they have a, they split the bracket and they weld both sides. You put, cut it in half, put it around and weld it so you're equally welded all around. There is an old t tube uh, drawing, that, and I got it somewhere in my deal, and it gave you a sequence to weld these things to try to keep the huge straight. I've got to go back and find that because I was uh, asked about that the other day. But, uh, in my world, we don't put the bearing ends on until last. That's the last thing right. we put on. We're very critical, especially like my house is this wide. Uh, you know, it, it, it really binds the bearings. So uh, it, I just try to weld them in one pass, try to not, you know, uh, you can weld it here, move over here, weld it. Uh, I mean, I always hold a, a air nozzle right next to it and cool it. Okay, so you're cooling it with an air nozzle. If I've got a lot of welding on it, I do this. Okay, and that's that would be that kind of advice that I would trust. You've done you've done enough of yeah, them, so I've made every mistake out here. You know, if, if you made it up, and you, made that mistake, so if yeah. you can tell me, I can cool it good enough with an air nozzle to keep yeah, going on the line. Keep the heat out of it, uh, okay, so I got my brackets on. I'm not afraid to take an old rear end. I'm not afraid to cut brackets off an old nine inch or whatever. I'm not afraid to weld brackets on. I'm afraid if I do a snot weld, it doesn't work. That I'm trying to clean up with a grinder to make it look good not a good thing but if my brackets are stuck what's a good I mean we got radius rods we got four lengths we got triangulated yeah, that's, that's a real mixed bag of, of uh, opinions and uh, theoretically technically we put a ladder bar you know a non-articulating arm of okay. some sort you have created this big huge kind of roll bar mm -hmm. people don't look at that they thought oh you know what do you mean I said well you can go back to practice. I already just when I first started building houses, and I was learning these things. And uh, I said, let me ask you something. You go out there, and that car is sitting on the start line. When you leave, the rear bumper and the lights on the ground, the left is looking for the sky, and the rear ends sitting parallel to the ground. You tell me what twisted in that car. Something, something twisted physically. Now it didn't. You can't catch it when you come back later because it never took it past a yield point. The material didn't fail, so it came back to zero. I said, but at some point, you, you don't do that. Street cars have the same problem, just not as severe because they're piled with the tires and things like that. So a lot of guys put ladder bars or, or in, in the industry, they call them hairpins or mm -hmm. radius rods or whatever. Rubber. But uh, And it got the same problem, but you don't have a lot of suspension movement and the cars, are they roll a little bit, so things, you know, they do move around a little bit. Mm -hmm. so, it's a, I, I prefer something that articulates, but there's ways to do it. Uh, I think I, I've been looking at some things to do and play with some designs to do that where, where it looks like it's a, a hairpin, but it's, it's moving up here, it's floating up here. It let it, it let it work a little bit. And, uh, uh, there's no real good rule. I mean, just you just don't want the thing twisting and breaking. 
the guys build stuff lightweight. And, and I, I worry about guys that get these little cracker box welders and zip, zip you know, it fails. Yeah, <laughs> the quality weld is a good start. Yeah, and I what I've found, good. I don't know if you've found this too, we, we used to use, it seemed to me that there was a standard. I mean, if you had cold rolled and there was some expectations, I don't know that I trust any of that anymore. I always try to look for domestic material, and it is still out there. I mean, you still get it. Something made in this country, and it'll meet. It'll meet. Uh, was it ASMT? I think that's what it is, their, their minimum specs. And you can go online. Any of these guys, like uh, George from the Blue Book, huge technical reference. And they used to hand these books out. And they were very hard to get. And I don't even play even print them anymore. Uh, but it gave you all the materials, all the properties. If it was weldable. It was machinable. All that stuff's out there. Uh, Ryerson had one, uh, the Blue Book, which is Earl Jordan's company. Uh, it's a real good reference for anybody, uh, not just not just well, machinists, just general knowledge. You can uh, you can go to any of the big material companies, you know, the U.S. Steel, any of those guys, and they'll give you all the specs on square tube and rectangle tube, round tube, and uh, you just get good material. A lot of people, all well, mine is all seven eighths or whatever. It's not necessarily the size of the tube. Yeah. It's the material the tube is made out of. Exactly. It's and understanding that that's what it is, just because it's marketed that way. A grade eight bolt don't always make yeah. it a grade eight bolt. You anymore. don't necessarily need a grade eight bolt. I mean, no, I mean you got different. You want, a, you want a bolt that bends. You want something shear. to bend and it won't <laughs> shear. Now if you got a stronger bolt, right. but it shear you. Know. Exactly. They get kind of a little scared. Another thing is I. Uh, I've seen guys come here, well, I built this frame, out of, uh, like a space-type cube chassis for these cars. I went well, down and got black pipe. I said, pipe for carrying water. It's not carrying your life. <laughs> yeah. And they do that, and they argue the point. That, so I don't get in these arguments online or any of this stuff. I just no. stay out of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've just got more of a technical mentality. And I, it's not because I came by naturally. I just got around some real smart people at one time. That car interest and they were engineers and, and they said, hey, wait, just kind of just a kind of think about these things. Well, that, that's, I kind of mentioned that over there. We've come a long way in the last, say, 50 years even on, on materials that we use and techniques and welders and class cutters. That just the equipment we use has come a long way. We were talking about this. We got some machinery here. We're talking old stuff. Now, the New World CNC, we were over in the CNC class cutter not too long ago. and it's just like it's hard to uh, real quick story. A friend of mine had a big oil field manufacturing place in Fort Worth, and they had big manual machines. And they built big hydraulic cylinders. They had one that had 14 inches through the center of the head stump that shuts on both ends. So he was hiring machinists, and they real specific what they were looking for. These guys would walk in and where's the CNC stuff? Yeah. They didn't have a clue. <laughs> no clue. <laughs> so, but. I mean, sometimes you learn from experience, but it's it's good to be able to. Josh is the guy that runs. He can take a CAD program and and um, build brackets with the machine, and it's just amazing what we got. I wish we could take more time and get specific about just we're going to build this and we're going to do that with it and and engineer it to a, whatever this one's going in this car. Man, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit before we put it in before you go. Sure. Um, but if you didn't get anything out of this, get this. Good welds. I mean, a good rear end, a good suspension, it's got to have good welds. I mean, that's, don't trust your life to, I think I got it. I think I got a good weld. Don't warp your rear end. You'll do it with too much heat in the wrong spot, trying to get a good weld, or just trying to get a weld of any kind. There's no one way to hook up a suspension. You know, one of my big passions over the years is I read a lot. I always, since I was a kid, I read everything. I always read technical things, history, things like that, air, aviation things, and I still do. And my son, Robert here, he's, he's we're pretty careful. If I buy something, I know it's going to be of interest to him. And that, maybe not so much some of the technical stuff, but all the mechanics, the history, whatever. And uh, so as I've worked in different areas of bigger metro places, Kansas City, Dallas State. I haunt bookstores, few places, the sources, and things. And I buy a lot of, uh, hard to find, but I've collected a lot of old vintage automotive 
technical books, mm -hmm. design, engineering books, things like that. And it's really interesting. You go back, uh, you can talk about the Scarab. It was built in 1958. And I look at it, and the free runner to it that was built, uh, which is the Troutman Bond Special, and you look, and it's more hot rodish, California hot rod, the suspension and all. But even further back then, in the Mercedes and uh, some of the early cars, I mean, in the 30s and 20s, we're copying those guys. A lot, of the, a lot of these cars are not that big in, in advance in, in, uh, in the technical, and uh, they're really pretty neat deals. So it, it's, uh, uh, it's only until they've been a, probably a real, really well that number of years. The computer era of calculating and, and mm -hmm. simulating mm -hmm. things on, on the computer screen and uh, the interest in good handling, like, you know, this, these new Camaros, you know, that independent suspension, a remarkable piece of work. Art Marshall up there builds a one, and, and I know those guys real well, and I was an engineering guy really well, and they, they made a lot of improvements that the John Motors did to the production piece, and, and uh, we've talked about it and what that thing's capable of doing, and it's just like, it's not, you know, like, you know, the Bob here, he got 2,000 for a charge for these guys here, and Getting it, getting the 72 Chevelle is like Conestoga wagon mm -hmm. in Paris. And I love those cars in there. I'd be hard pressed to drive them in the day anymore. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it, it has come a long way. But yeah. uh, so. I think we better better wrap this or we're yeah. going to turn this into an hour show no, I think no, which would be easy to do and I want to pick your brain on specifics here. Time. So thanks for being with us. Uh, today is Friday. So we're going to take all them shares and we're going to get somebody assigned. We're going to get the class cutting again with that new technology and this young guy behind the camera here. <laughs> so Josh, the voice of Spirit Cars, will finish that sign. And the next contest we have is name that Thursday night show. So keep on doing that. We'll come up with some kind of prize for that. Next Thursday we'll decide what it's going to be. And uh, thanks for being with us. Bob, I appreciate you having me here. All right. And we'll see you all next time.